In the first decade of the 21st century, it is astonishing that the fate of refugees and asylum seekers would emerge as a worldwide problem. In an age when the movement of everything across borders, from capital to fashion, from information to news, from germs to money has intensified, human mobility continues to be criminalized. The refugee is increasingly treated not only as an alien body, but as a, the enemy who is interned in detention camps, in deportation sites, or in absurd Euro-bureaucratic parlance gathered in hotspots. Words from her 1943 article, we refugees are uncannily appropriate to describe the situation in Europe and increasingly the in the United States and as well. In the United States. She wrote, as well. the Committee of European she Peoples wrote, went to pieces when and because it allowed its weakest member to be excluded and persecuted. End of quote. Excluded Arendt was referring to the Jews of Arendt was referring to the Jews of Europe who were rendered refugees, displaced persons, and eventually stateless by Nazi hegemony. But the so-called refugee crisis, which became most visible after 2014, is having the same consequence today of destroying European comity and solidarity. A continent of respect for human rights and international law has become a continent of failed administrative logic bureaucratic absurdities, and national egotisms behind which hide right-wing politicians and nativist demagogues. It is surely a supreme historical irony that the European Union, emerging as it did out of the ashes of the Holocaust and with the bitter memory of two world wars behind it, should find itself at the point of unraveling because, among other factors to be sure, of the desired entry into Europe of two, two and a half million Syrians and others. Of course, no one is being sent to labor or extermination camps today. Yet the European Union is failing to live up to its commitments by stamping refugees' arms with indelible ink, as the Czech and Hungarian police did, by having them be chased by police dogs and water cannons, as the Macedonians, Slovenians, and Hungarians did, by subjecting them to excruciating limbo about their future lives, which Greece still does with 50,000 unprocessed refugees housed on the islands, and which France and the UK have done shamelessly by creating the now dismantled jungle, so-called jungle in Calais. Unable to face their own demons of racism, Islamophobia, human rights violations, and sheer egotism, European leaders have chosen to conclude an agreement with Turkey and its authoritarian president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, in early 2016. Most likely, this agreement contradicts the 1951 Convention on Refugees and its protocol at least several levels, but it was presented as the deus ex machina to solve Europe's and Greece's refugee problems. Although the refugee crisis is affecting the European Union in specific ways because of the special architecture of the EU, including Dublin agreements, which I will not go into, it is not only the European continent that is experiencing this problem. The UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, notes that at the end of 2015, the number of forcibly displaced persons both in their own country and across international borders stood at 65.3 million, the highest level on record, and with no end in sight to conflicts in places such as Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the number at the end of 2016 most likely stands at 67 million people. Worldwide, one in every 113 persons are displaced. Among these 67 million, 21.3 million roughly are refugees who have crossed international borders. 38 million are internally displaced, 
in their own countries, moving from one region to another. 20 million are stateless, whether they reside within or outside their home territory. As these numbers have grown, not only has the number of camps increased to house these groups, but camps have ceased to be places where one held people temporarily, rather they have become semi-permanent. The largest refugee camp in the world, Kenya's Dadaab, here we go, is 20 years old and houses 420,000 refugees. The Palestinian refugee camps in southern Lebanon are, in many cases, nearly 70 to 50 years old, depending on whether the, you count the refugee population as having been created in 1948 or 1968. The refugees who live in these camps, and in some cases who have spent their entire lives there, become PRSs, that is, those in protracted refugee situation. Even before the latest executive action taken by President Trump, on suspending the entry of Syrian refugees into the United States for 90 days and freezing the visas of nationals of Iraq, Libya, Iran, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, the United States, since September 11th, has instituted a new form of migration regime called crim migration, migration and criminalization by legal scholars. Under this new regime, not only have deportations of so-called aliens with criminal records, big or small, increased, but many families have been torn apart through the separation of undocumented parents and children. The so-called DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which exempts children arriving in the United States younger than age 15 from deportation, is likely to be scrapped under President Trump. Refugees, asylees, stateless persons, IDPs, internally displaced persons, PRSs, those in protracted refugee situation, and DACAs are new categories of human beings created by an international state system in turmoil. They are subject to a special kind of precarious existence and their plight reveals the most fateful distinction between so-called human rights or the rights of man in the older locution and the rights of the citizen. Between the universal claims to human dignity and the specificities of indignity suffered by those who possess only their human rights. From Hannah Arendt's famous discussion of the right to have rights to Giorgio Agamben's Homo Sacer, to Judith Butler's concept of precarious lives and Jacques Rancière's call to the enactment of rights, the asylum seeker, the stateless, the refugee, and the undocumented have become metaphors as well as symptoms of a much deeper malaise in the politics of late modernity. I want to begin with an analysis of the right to have rights in Arendt's The Origins of totalitarianism and discuss its philosophical perplexities. In the second half of my lecture, I will consider the quandaries of so-called humanitarian reason in Didier Fassin's felicitous phrase. One of the first to accuse Arendt of having succumbed to the pitfalls of humanitarian reason was Jacques Rancière. Rancière not only misreads Arendt, I will argue, but much of what he defends as the necessary enactment of rights is quite compatible with an Arendtian understanding of political agency. In conclusion, I will claim that we need a new reconceptualization of the relationship between international law and emancipatory politics, a new way of understanding how to negotiate the facticity and the validity of the law including, but not only, international humanitarian law, such as to create new vistas for the political. Although Arendt is often read as if for her freedom meant emancipation from embodiment and embeddedness, I will argue in conclusion that the right to have rights is a call not only to a right to belonging, citizenship and agency, but also a call to a right to place, to emplacement, in a human community. 
This is both a materialist and a feminist insight, I will claim. So let me uh, begin now with a close uh, reading of Arendt. This is the first quote on the handout. In a much cited passage of the origins of totalitarianism, which reformulated her existential experience of statelessness between 1933 and 1951, um, Arendt formulated a powerful aporia. Aporia is the term she uses in German for what she's doing. She wrote, we become aware of the existence of a right to have rights, and that means to live in a framework where one is judged by one's actions and opinions, and a right to belong to some kind of organized human community only when millions of people emerge who had lost and could not regain these rights because of the new global political situation. The right that corresponds to this loss and that was never even mentioned among the human rights cannot be expressed in the categories of the 18th century because they presume that rights spring immediately from the nature of man. The rights to have rights or the rights of every individual to belong to humanity should be governed by humanity itself. And she ends, as she knows rather aporetically, it is by no means certain whether this is possible. And of course, I want to single out several philosophical issues which run through these famous reflections. First, the question of the normative justification of rights, and in particular of the famous phrase, the right to have rights. Throughout this discussion, Arendt polemicizes against the grounding of human rights upon any conception of human nature or history. For her, conceptions of human nature commit the mistake of treating humans as mere substances, as if they were things in nature. Following St. Augustine and Heidegger, for her, humans are the ones for whom the question of being has become a question. She quotes Augustine, quid ergo sum deus meus quae natura sum, what then am I my God, what is my nature? The answer simply is, she says, question mihi factus sum, I have become a question for myself. And this capacity for self-questioning is the source of human freedom and differentiates humans from substances as they exist in nature. Arendt, therefore, distinguishes between the human condition and any static conceptualization of human nature or human essence. Although human freedom is not limitless and is subject to the facticity of the human condition, namely worldliness, plurality, natality, labor, work, and action. And I'm sorry, I'm not going into great detail about her philosophy here because I do want to stay on the problem of statelessness and refugees. Although human freedom is not limitless and is subject to the facticity of the human condition, it is with reference to this condition alone and not in the light of a fixed understanding of human nature that we must try to justify the right to have rights. Arendt's rejection now of any justificatory role that history may play is complex. We know that since the late 1950s, she is engaged in a conversation with Karl Marx, whom she accuses of having brought the tradition of Western political thought to an end by substituting a philosophy of history for a political philosophy proper. Arendt's reading of Marx is often dismissive and erroneous in many ways, but I'm not concerned to evaluate it here. She was greatly influenced by Walter Benjamin's critique of deterministic accounts of history, whose thesis, famous thesis on the philosophy of history, she brought over to the United States with her in a suitcase after Walter Benjamin's suicide in Port Bow, Spain in 1941. So to understand Arendt's critique of Marx, you first have to begin with Walter Benjamin. Any account of history for her, either privileging a mechanism of social forces that would act as the engines of change, or any teleological philosophy which would attribute to history an end goal, a telos, is intellectually shallow, she argued. 
Even more, it is morally reprehensible because it makes humans into quote-unquote instruments of a world spirit in the Hegelian sense and robs them of oppositional agency. One has to act against the grain of history for Arendt as well as for Walter Benjamin. What then is Arendt's own justification of the right to have rights? Many passages, such as the following, have been read as displaying Arendt's decisionism and or political existentialism. Second quote. We are not born equal. We become equal as members of a group on the strength of our decision to guarantee ourselves mutually equal rights. Our political life rests on the assumption that we can produce equality through organization because man can act and change and build a common world together with his equals and only with his equals. Yeah? So this just assumes that, in fact, equality comes into existence through political organization and the creation of political entities. Some have interpreted such passages not only as displaying Arendt's existential decisionism, but for accepting the English, so-called, as opposed to the French interpretation of uh, rights. And what this refers to um, is uh, Arendt's appeal to Burke. Um, in these passages, in these famous uh, um, uh, passages, um, Arendt writes, that uh, her words seem to be ironically confirmed uh, through uh, Burke's uh, ironical, bitter, and belated reflections on the revolution in uh, France. So uh, the question here is whether, in effect, Arendt sees human rights as entitlements or entailments, or the rights of the Englishman as Burke famously argued against the follies of the French uh, Revolution. Uh, despite Arendt's reference to uh, Burke, I think her entire discussion of the right to have rights, unlike Burke's, is a critique of the status quo and a plea to transform the sovereign privileges of the state system in denying rights to certain groups of humans. Arendt, unlike Jeremy Bentham, then, and Alistair McIntyre in our times, does not consider human rights to be nonsense upon stilts. Nonetheless, I've criticized the lack of normative foundations in Arendt's political thought in several writings in the last decade, and have sought to give a better justification for her concept of the right to have rights to a concept of communicative freedom. But I shall not pursue this issue about the philosophical justification of Arendt's concept of rights. We can come back to it in the discussion, because I, as I said, my focus in this lecture is not this justification problem, but rather the question of the right to have rights and its legal underpinnings. Now, let me turn to the second of the issues uh, in this famous passage, or these famous passages. Arendt herself writes on two registers and shifts from one to the other without much analytical clarification. I want to call these registers phenomenological and institutional. I quote, and what I mean by the phenomenological is the description of the existential lived experience of statelessness. And this is uh, the uh, third quote in your handout. The fundamental deprivation of human rights is manifested first and above all in the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinions significant and actions effective. This extremity and nothing else is the situation of people deprived of human rights. They're deprived not of the right to freedom, but of the right to action, not of the right to think whatever they please, but of the right to opinion. Puzzling. For Arendt, a place in the world is always the space within which some form of human behavior and action take place, and thought and opinion are communicated because humans cannot 
but exist by appearing to each other. The human condition unfolds in a space of appearances in which we act, speak, and interact. But this space of appearances is not always institutionalized as a public political sphere. Only under certain conditions does the human space of appearance, which is part of the human condition, we cannot but be by interacting with each other. Only under certain conditions does the space of appearance become a public sphere with its own institutions, laws, and demarcations from other realms. For Arendt, who now shifts from a phenomenological to an institutional register in one and the same passage, the stateless, the refugee, and the displaced persons are said to be deprived, quote, not of the right to freedom, but of the right to action, not of the right to think whatever they please, but of the right to opinion. Uh, these are puzzling claims. Strictly speaking, such individuals, particularly under conditions of internment in camps, are of course deprived of freedom to act in certain ways. But they are deprived of the right to action and the right to opinion in the Arantian sense in that they lack an institutional framework through which what they say and do can be heard, evaluated, and responded by others and, and attributed to the person. That is to say, human beings have ceased to be the source of recognized validity claims, which can only be responded to with respect to a shared public framework in the world. Individuals' capacities for responsibility and agency are diminished under these circumstances. They face the threat of becoming worldless precisely because they have no demonstrable institutional and interactional framework within which they can be situated. Now, this diminution of the person and the increasing sense of unreality that grows through life in concentration camps has been explored primarily not in philosophy but in works of literature by Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, Imro Kertes, and others. Well aware of the work of social psychologists also, such as Bruno Bettelheim, who were one of the first to write about the camps, Arendt's discussion moves between a phenomenology of worldlessness and the loss of the public sphere by the stateless. What kind of moral and political agency can we attribute to human beings who are in the process of losing their place in the world? It is clear that in camps, the space of appearances of human action and words does not altogether disappear. And human beings have not really lost all their capacity for action and opinion. But there is an oft-noted phenomenon, particularly by novelists, of depression, listlessness, staring into the void, dissociation among camp inmates that proves that Arendt's phenomenology of worldlessness is quite apt, as um, she states in these passages. OK, what about the institutional and legal dimensions of Arendt's discussion in our contemporary context? Since Arendt penned her discussion of the right to have rights, international institutions and international law have changed the landscape against the background of which she wrote. Thus, this is quote four, the Universal Human Rights Declaration of 1948 in Article 13, 14, and 15 addresses some of these questions. Article 13 reads, everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. Article 14 encodes the right of asylum. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. This right may not be invoked in the case of prosecutions arising from non-political crimes or from acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Obviously, those convicted of crimes against humanity, for example, cannot 
ask amnesty or asylum. Now, Article 15 seeks guarantees against denaturalization or loss of citizenship by saying everyone has a right to nationality. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality nor denied to the right to change his nationality. Okay? Together with the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 1948, the 1951 Geneva Conventions on the Status of Refugees, and in particular, the two international human rights conventions, which are taken to basically uh, give more legal form to the hortatory claims of the UDHR, namely the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, these documents and institutions of compliance and monitoring have altered the legal landscape for the entitlement to and exercise of international human rights. International human rights theory and practice has implications for RN's considerations. In the first place, Article 15 of the UDHR that denaturalization and rendering human beings stateless is a violation of international human rights is in complete agreement with RN's intention. The obverse side of denaturalization is naturalization or gaining access to citizenship or to some kind of permanent membership or residency in a polity. There is no such human right in any of the international covenants, although there are many provisions against the naturalization. Granting citizenship as well as the conditions in accordance with which it can be granted remain sovereign state privileges as the 10 million stateless in our world currently still testify to. In my earlier book, The Rights of Others, followed upon the Seeley lectures delivered here in Cambridge, I have suggested how such a human right to membership and citizenship may be formulated in philosophical terms. Arendt was acutely aware that although developments in international human rights law were absolutely necessary to address the plight of the stateless and the displaced, at the time of the composition of the origins of totalitarianism, she believed that international law, quote, is only concerned with laws and treaties which regulate the relations of sovereign nations in peace and war. That is, she considered the concept of crimes against humanity, pr first proposed by Chief Justice Jackson in the Nuremberg trials, to anticipate a form of legality that would stand above the nations, she said, I'm sorry, stand over the nations, important distinction maybe, but under the then existing understanding of state sovereignty, she claimed that this was impossible. Nowhere is this continuing tension between sovereignty transcending human rights claims and sovereignty norms more apparent than in the case of the major legal instruments of the post-war period that still regulate refugee and asylum movements in our world. The 1951 convention and their 1967 protocol generate a series of distinctions between convention refugees and other displaced persons on accounts of civil war, generalized violence, and natural catastrophes. Quote five, on the one hand, it is stated, quote, that the principle of non-refoulement is so fundamental that no reservations or derogations may be made to it. It provides that no one shall expel or return refoulé, from fact, a refugee against his or her will in any manner whatsoever to a territory where he or she fears threats to life or freedom, end of quote. But on the other hand, the five protected categories of refugees in the Geneva Conventions are race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. With the leadership of Canada and the United States, these categories have recently been expanded 
to cover gender-based and gender-related crimes in the first place, female genital mutilation, and maybe even practices of child marriages, but uh, persecutions of gay and lesbian transgender peoples is still not accepted as grounds for claiming refuge and asylum, though there are developments in that respect too. The Convention Refugee, as is generally acknowledged, was modeled after the dissident, the prisoner of conscience, and the resistance fighter. The Convention requires proof of individual persecution, imposing on refugees themselves and the receiving states quite a heavy administrative procedure of examination and verification. In an age of increased generalized violence, ethnic cleansing, civil wars, and armed confrontations among non-state groups, in what sense, then, is the 1951 Convention adequate to deal with the rights of the most vulnerable? In response to such concerns, the Organization of African Unity, now African Union, formulated a convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa and adopted it in Addis Ababa on 10 September 1969. A similar document called the Cartagena Declaration on Refugees was adopted at a colloquium held at Cartagena, Colombia in November 1984. This document, while non-binding, set a regional standard for refugee processing and resettlement in Central America, Mexico, and Panama. Despite significant developments in expanding human rights, prohibitions against statelessness, recognizing the right of non refoulement and the right to seek asylum, these legal instruments have further shortcomings. And here we have to turn from law to the politics of the post-World War II global refugee regimes. Neither the 1951 Refugee, Refugee Convention nor other legal instruments recognize conditions of extreme poverty and material deprivation as grounds for legitimate asylum. Economic migrants are viewed as individuals who raise spurious claims to protection and refuge. But why are extreme poverty and material deprivation itself not legitimate grounds for seeking opportunities to escape from them? particularly under conditions of global economic interdependence, when the politics of advanced capitalist economies and the damage they cause to the environment all over the globe have far-reaching consequences, what sense does it make to turn so-called economic migrants away at the door, or better still, to douse them with water cannons or set police dogs upon them, as was done in the so-called jungle in Cali? Not redressing extreme poverty is just a fundamental human rights violation as torturous. Furthermore, the subject of human rights law is the individual person. Even if the circumstances and causes leading individuals to seek refuge and asylum are always collective. In centering on the individual, or almost always collective, let me put it to that, in centering on the individual, the law is forced to neglect the interdependence of economic, climate-related, military, and other factors in the society of states which give rise to these collective circumstances. Finally, laws and legal regimes create further differentiations and distinctions which trap individuals in conditions of administrative dependency. This aspect of what in Foucauldian parlance is referred to as legal governmentality, which generates such distinctions as among displaced persons, refugees in protracted situations, stateless persons, etc. This aspect of legal governmentality is a double-edged sword, often robbing individuals of their autonomy, dignity, and initiative, which their protection of human rights was intended to guarantee in the first place. Refugee camps, whether in cities or in des the desert, are sites of indignity and humiliation. The elaborate game of head counting, status granting, and legal classification in the meantime has spawned a set of transnational institutions, treaties, litigations, 
as well as creating armies of aid workers, humanitarians, camp directors, international lawyers, in addition to NGOs and INGOs. These limitations of legal governmentality, together with the uh, apparatus of legal instruments, the treaties that they have given rise, result in the pitfalls of what Didier Fassin has called humanitarian reason. He will be lecturing in your geography department on <laughs> Wednesday. And quote six, Didier Fassin, to whom we owe this term, defines it as follow, follows, quote, humanitarian reason governs precarious lives, the lives of the unemployed and the asylum seeker, the lives of sick immigrants and people with AIDS, the lives of disaster victims and victims of conflict, threatened and forgotten lives that humanitarian government brings into existence by protecting and revealing them." End of quote. Vassin, who for many years worked with Médecins Sans Frontières in a high capacity, she's a field, he's a field medical anthropologist, okay? So there's a great deal of field experience based behind these generalizations. Fassin, who for many years worked with Médecins Sans Frontières in a high capacity, is brutally honest about the shortcomings of humanitarian reason, which is certainly one of the offshoots of the politics of international human rights. He writes, uh, quote seven, I have tried to grasp what humanitarian reason means and what it hides, to take it neither as the best of all possible governments nor as an illusion that misleads us. It seems to me that by viewing it from various angles, we can render the global logic of humanitarian reason more intelligible." End of quote. An earlier and more influential critique of humanitarianism that linked it to Arendt's right to have rights was Jacques Rancière in his essay, Who is the Subject? of the rights of man. I'm going into some detail into the contemporary criticisms of Hannah Arendt by Fassin, Rancière, uh, and Agamben, because I do, I do believe that there is a great deal of both misunderstanding here, and at the same time, an important problem about the politics of human rights that I want to, to get to, so bear with me. Uh, quote number eight. Rancière, in his famous essay, Who is the Subject of the Rights of Men, composed in 2004 after the US invasion of Iraq had taken place and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were at their height, begins by noting how the rights of man or human rights were rejuvenated by the dissident movements of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 80s. But then, he writes, they became transformed in the first decade of the 21st century into, the quote, the rights of the rightless, of the population hunted out of their homes and land and threatened by ethnic slaughter. They appeared more and more as the rights of the victims, the rights of those who were unable to enact any rights or even any claims in their name so that eventually their rights had to be upheld by others at the cost of shattering the ed edifice of international human rights in the name of a new right to humanitarian interference, which boiled down to the right to invasion. So this quote establishes some kind of a slippery slope from the concept of the right to have rights to humanitarian interference and invasion. So human rights become the ideological scaffolding for humanitarian reason at best and for humanitarian intervention at worst. Now this essay is rich in polemic and sweeping in its generalizations. Often it's hard to distinguish between Rancière's understanding of what Arendt said and the way Arendt's words have been deployed by others such as Agamben. Unlike Arendt who carefully distinguished totalitarianism, from other regimes such as tyranny and despotism, the camps are said by Agamben to be the culmination of a logic of biopower intrinsic to modernity. And this is not, this is not Arendt. Nevertheless, 
there is a paradoxical formula used by Rancière. It's a bit of a brain twister. It's the quote nine, which can be made compatible with an Arendtian understanding of the political. He writes, the rights of men are the rights of those who have not the rights that they have and have the rights that they have not. I have to sit and think about this for a bit. Okay, the subject of rights are actually those who engage in the enactment of rights, such as to bridge the two sides of the equation. The first half of this paradox, the rights of men are the rights of those who have not the rights that they have, is illustrated by Rancière with respect to Olympe de Gouche, the aristocratic woman who sided with the revolution, but who was guillotined by the Jacobins for participating in the male sphere of citizenship and questioning the place of the ideal of the woman mother citizen that the revolutionaries were devising under the influence of Rousseau's uh, regressive theory of gender roles. And Olympe de Gouche, in effect, claimed the rights that she did not have according to the Declaration, because although the Declaration spoke in the name of human rights, it was not intended that women themselves would become part of the, part of the public sphere. She exercised the human rights which the Declaration proclaimed that she had as a human being, but to which she was not entitled because she was a woman. But by doing so, she became the subject of rights which she did not have, i.e. the right of participation in the public sphere. Those who have the rights they have not can only claim them by enacting them or acting such as to appropriate them for themselves. There is something powerful in Ranciere's formula, and I want to suggest that it may indeed be helpful for thinking of the disjunction between human rights and the rights of the, of the citizen. That is to say that, in effect, if you read the language of having human rights, is misleading because they are not subjects of property, but always political rela relations and enactment of certain kinds of uh, claims. Uh, clearly, Arendt's description of the condition of the stateless often seems to render them as, as object individuals, for example, in this moving and powerful passage from We Refugees. Now, this is Camp Bourse in southern France, where she was imprisoned. And this was a camp mainly for refugees from the Spanish Civil War. But a number of German Jewish refugees were put here after Paris fell to Hitler. And had she not escaped, she would have ended up in Auschwitz. That's where the majority ended up, OK? So she writes in We Refugees, quote number 10. We lost our home, which means the familiarity of daily life. We lost our occupation, which means the confidence that we are of some use in this world. We lost our language, which means the naturalness of reactions, the simplicity of gestures, the unaffected expression of feelings, end of quote. But some things have changed in our world. The refugee, the asylee, and the stateless person are increasingly political actors who claim the rights that they do not supposedly have, i.e. the rights that are denied to them. Les sans-papiers in France, the dreamers in the United States, los indignados in Spain, many of whom are migrant workers, are demanding the rights that they do not have, at least according to states' constitutions in which they may be residing, but which they do have as human beings under various international human rights conventions. These are the rights to work for refugees, to schooling for their children, to health care, a speedy resolution of their asylum applications, and representation via council in their own language during intake interviews. Very important condition. Today's refugees and asylum seekers are aware of these rights under international law, also because of the remarkable solidarity exercised by many civil society groups and organizations, transnational civil society. 
because of such solidarity, they do not hesitate to invoke these rights even in the face of recalcitrant and hostile border guards and police. And for me, the best example of this was when the refugees two years ago were trying to pass uh, from uh, Macedonia to uh, onto Austria and Hungary, the Hungarian people lined up on the streets and say, we are ashamed of Orban or excuse us for Orban, okay? So the transnational gestures of solidarity are real. So uh, I want to say now, I'm uh, coming slowly to a conclusion, international human rights and humanitarian law can lead to the pitfalls of humanitarian reason against which Fassin and Rancière warn us, but they can also have what I call a jurisgenerative effect. By jurisgenerativity, I mean the following. Laws acquire meaning in that they are interpreted in the context of rules and significations, which often, however, cannot be controlled. There can be no rules without interpretation. Rules can only be followed insofar as they are interpreted, as Wittgenstein taught us. But there are also no rules, including legal norms, which can control the varieties of all interpretation that they can be subject to within all different hermeneutical contexts. Law's normativity does not consist in the grounds of its formal validity, i.e. legality alone. Law can also structure an extra legal normative universe by developing new vocabularies for public claim making, by encouraging new forms of subjectivity to engage with the public sphere, and by injecting existing relations of power with relations of justice to come. Law is not simply a method of coercion and an instrument of domination or the silencing of the census, as Rancière claims. Undoubtedly, it is also such an instrument and such a medium of domination as well. But the disjunction between the facticity and the validity of law, to use Jürgen Habermas's terms, creates a space into which a politics of jurisgenerativity can be inserted which both signals to the presence of the gap between the normative promise of law and its coercive present, and tries to a politics that tries to bridge this gap in the name of future forms of justice to come. The dialectic between humanitarian reason and jurisgenerativity has created possibilities in our world for the stateless, the refugee, and the asylum seeker to negotiate the line between being an object subject of compassion and administrative logic on the one hand, and being a legal person and a political activist raising claims to recognition of international human rights on the other. Let me conclude by returning to Hannah Arendt. What makes Arendt's reflections on the right to have rights so compelling are the various dimensions it addresses at once the philosophical, the phenomenological, the legal. For philosophical purists, her non-foundationalism and lack of clarity concerning the right to have rights will present a problem. Nevertheless, this phrase evokes so much and can be dealt with at so many levels that it continues to enlighten us as we continue to face the political conundrums of our own days. For Arendt, freedom is world building with others and requires a place in the world within which we are situated in networks of action and interaction. And it's only because we are bodies in space that we also need a place in the world. Although Arendt has frequently been misread as if she wanted to dispense with embodiment, both by Rancière and Judith Butler, this is not right. The human condition is deeply embodied and embedded in the webs of narrative and action that can only be housed in a material world constituted through the labor of our bodies and the work of our hands, to use Locke's phrase. This conception of embodied agency is not only compatible with contemporary feminist theories' insights into embodiment, but we should also not forget that Arendt is the theorist of natality, which she explicitly juxtaposed to, to what she called Western philosophical traditions love affair with death. And guess who she was thinking of here? 
Natality for her, Heidegger, of course, not only Heidegger, but from Socrates to Heidegger. Not only for her, natality for her, I'm sorry, does not only mean the dependency and precarity of human beings, but also the ontological fact that no human child who is ever born will be like any other in his or her actions and speech. This embodied capacity for human agency requires a place in the world in and through which it can unfold. And this is the point at which contemporary migration studies and feminist theory can meet and cooperate. The world's refugee camps are mostly housed by women and children who are more vulnerable than men because of their bodily needs and more dependent upon a stable place in the world than their male counterparts. More children than adults perish in refugee camps, and women in camps are subject to sexual assault, prostitution, abuse, and trafficking. Analyzing the gender politics of the right to have rights and to address the gender complexities of humanitarian reason, then, is our task ahead. I have tried to argue in this lecture that the sea change from the right to have rights to the critique of humanitarian reasoning, contemporary thought, should not lead us to a flippant dismissal of international human rights law as being a shield for, the humani for humanitarian interventions. Rather, one has to recognize the unending tension and disjunction between the facticity and the validity of the law and the institutions in general that they give rise, as they give rise to those cracks and fissures into which a politics of Jewish generativity, duly aware of the complex gender dimensions, can intervene. Thank you for listening. Then.